Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Metaphysical Podcast for part two of our talk on time travel. It seems like nobody is talking much about the weird details of the actual time travel machines and gadgets that have been reported to exist. So we'll be diving into the chronovisor and devices like the secret Nazi device, Dick Glock. We also wanted to cover one of the most famous stories of time travel out there about John Titer. Because everyone asks John Vivanco here to remote view whether that story was real or not. Then we'll talk about AI time machine patents, more stories about time travel, and what we think it all really means. So join remote viewer John Vivanco and me, investigative researcher Rob Counts, for a show that's out of this world. If you're listening to the Metaphysical Podcast or you're watching us on a video platform, please leave us a five-star rating and review. It'll help us reach more people. Make sure you like and subscribe wherever you are as well. Thank you. John, how are yeah. you doing? Good. Awesome. Back to time travel. Back to time travel. Can't get away from it. What'd you say? Oh, can't get away from it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it is a thread throughout most of our uh, episodes. And uh, it's kind of fun, though, to talk about some of these specific stories that people are always asking us about. This, uh, yeah, yeah. this John Titer story has always been a really fascinating one, I guess, due to the details of the story. Right, right. And uh, right. What, what, what was the background of this story again? It, it first appeared on the Art Bell show, right? Yeah, Art received a, a chilling fax. <laughs> I would like to receive a chilling fax. I mean, people used to communicate through fax machines, so I guess he wrote down a bunch of stuff and sent it via fax to him, which set the whole thing off. You know? And, you know, Art, Art took it and ran with it. And that went on for years. You know, you get these reports through fax from the time traveler. Then, I almost want to set up a fax machine just to try to get a message from a time traveler. Like that just seems like a really good idea. Yeah, I think so. I know. I think so too. It's funny, you know, I mean, there's so many aspects of this, the old technology aspects, you know, even in the time uh, tighter story, I, I think are fascinating. Um, We'll get to that part, but it's like, you know, what sort of mystery do fax machines connect to? Can they connect to another dimension? Can you use a fax machine as a time travel device? Apparently you can use an IBM computer. I feel like that's what, that's what um, the Back to the Future DeLorean was missing was a fax machine. Yeah. Type in a number, not a flux capacitor. They needed a fax machine for that. But yeah, so um, now it was in online forums in 2001, 2000 and 2001, right? Like this happened around? Yeah, that was that was that was the year. Actually, I'd, I'd heard that um, it may have started earlier um, uh, with a John Titer character because you, you dig into research on this. There was some indication that it happened maybe began in the 1998 uh, and a John Titer character beginning to uh, go on forums, message board. I think it was actually the Art Bell, one of the Art Bell forums, but not many people engaged. I think they engaged after he went on a um, time travel slash physics forum and, and began to tell his story because there were people there who actually understood a bit about what he was talking about. Yeah, and, you know, okay, so some of the details are what make this story so compelling. He described what a time machine needs to work. Um, he described nuclear war and the future. He claimed that he was sent back to 1975 to get an IBM 5100 computer, which they needed to debug some legacy computer programs in 2036. His technical knowledge led people to believe that he was telling the truth. The, the, the reason why that IBM 5100 is so important to talk about regarding the time travel story that he was that he was telling us was that the IBM 5100 actually the, the creators of this personal computer didn't want people to know that you could actually use an IBM 5100 to do more capable work with with um, servers and things like that. that. Is that true? 
Yeah, right. So it was verified. This is actually verified by an IBM engineer that it had secret code in the back end um, that they did not release. They didn't tell the public about it because if they did, then other manufacturers could get a hold of that code and then begin to use it. But apparently it was needed to run the operating system. To Interesting. Some so, so yeah, so they're using, so they're using, you could use the 5100 for yourself or you could work on mainframes with it. So there was obviously some capabilities of the 5100 right. that if you started looking into this, you know, okay, if we're just talking about this actually being a hoax and it's not real, whoever who's writing this story is fairly knowledgeable or this is a real true time machine, like time, travel story right right that's right. what makes so i mean that is a ridiculous looking computer but well yeah, but the thing the thing with the ibm 5100 though i think i think i don't think they use it for time they didn't use it for time travel unfortunately i wish they did because you know it's like if they could use that maybe i could pull out my old atari like use that for exactly. time travel. but i think they needed that for sort of something like what we faced in the y2k era where um, uh, Unix-based operating systems were were uh, needed to deal with what the the I can't remember exactly what it was the 32k versus the or 32 bit it was, yeah 30, 32 bit. bit versus 64 bit at a certain point the 32 bit systems would break down so they needed right. at some point to turn everything over into 64 bits because there were only so many billions of, of data points, I guess, that it could process before it just basically crapped out. Right. And so if they didn't get this fixed, then the, what, the time, time travel program would collapse that he was a part of. Oh, which is... So he went back to the 70s first, and then he stopped off around the year 2000 to, he says, for personal, personal issues, personal things, deal with family, meet, meet up with Yay. family, maybe, you know future self yeah. or early self. Yeah. And there's a lot of discussion like that. And, you know, he is, uh, so the, here's some posts from, from, from Titer. He says, my time machine is a stationary mass temporal displacement unit manufactured by general electric. The unit, the unit is powered by two top spin dual positive singularities that produce a standard offset tipler Sin sinusoid. So he's using advanced vocabulary to describe these, right? And he says, in 2036, I live in Central Florida with my family, and I'm currently stationed at an army base in Tampa. The people that survived grew closer together. Life is centered on the family and then the community. I cannot imagine living even a few hundred miles away from my parents. There's no large industrial complex creating masses of useless food and recreational items. Food and livestock is grown and sold locally. People spend much more time reading and talking together face to face. Religion is taken seriously and everyone can multiply and divide their divide in their heads. So, you know, there's a lot of things that are described in this story where the people of the future who have been affected by whatever war or nuclear war that the, that is is there are actually quite critical of the people in 2000 and earlier because of the lavish life that they've been leading and how everything that they're doing is leading to this inevitable you know right problem well, what's interesting too is that in the in the last episode we did we were talking about the Armenian guy Yes. Who went into the future and and well, all the problems were caused by uh, global warming based off CO two levels that humans did. And then this yeah. one is no, this this one's about nuclear war. This one's about you know uh, or or civil war, et cetera. So it's like it's interesting these these different paths on timelines these things take. And you know, John Titer said that you know if if nothing happens, then we fix the problem. Right. But again, you know, you, you go down this path of, of thinking and believing that there are no strings of timelines that shoot off of each other. Right. There's like if if we don't do something now about this thing in the future, it's going to happen as opposed to. Anything can happen because we're the wave function is is always got all possibilities out there. Right. So I, I find it really fascinating the way these stories are laid out. And um, and the John Titer one is interesting to me because it was so huge. I remember back then 
listening to Art Bell late at night and, and hearing about these stories and just like, because you're not watching it on television. You're, you're, you're just listening to it and it's completely, utterly stoking the imagination. It was like a whole new way with the internet as well, because now he's posting on message forums to, to deepen this story, right? Because you go back and forth between late night listening to Art Bell and then going to the messaging forum where you can read what John Titer is talking about, which is just fascinating and endless way to, to produce media or to tell people what's going to happen. Yeah. So yes, we have looked into this one. We have absolutely looked into this one. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, go uh, ahead. Lindsay, can you pull that fax up? The, his first initial fax to Art Bell. We've got it here. And I think um, if you scroll down, it actually goes into, oh, wait. Okay, yeah, here. The, sorry, this is right. This is all it. So, um, yeah, I had to fax when I heard other time travelers calling in from any time past the year 2500 AD. Please let me explain. He goes into when time travel was um, invented, which was 2034. And he says that that offshoots of certain successful fusion reactor research allowed scientists at CERN to produce the world's first contained singularity engine, which could be true because CERN deals with, you know, bashing or flying particles around, bashing them together and, and, and trying to create singularities. You know, the basic design involves, he goes on to say, the basic design involves rotating singularities inside a magnetic field. By altering the speed and direction of rotation, you can travel both forward and backward in time. So you can scroll down a little bit. Uh, time itself can be understood in terms of connecting connected lines. When you go back in time, you travel on your original timeline. This is kind of where it gets interesting here, I think. This was a totally new concept for people, I think. So when you go back in time, you travel on your original timeline. When you turn your singularity engine off, a new timeline is created due to the fact that you and your time machine are now there. In other words, a new universe is created. And what's bizarre about this is this seems to parallel a little bit to what we were kind of researching with Project Looking Glass. And the different timelines and trying to figure right. out what was actually going to happen in the future, right? Right, right. He goes on to say, they, to go back. Oh, go ahead, John, sorry. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, 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 is, that is absolutely more akin to from what I, that is more akin to what I understand. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mean uh, what he's saying here or? What um, he's saying right there, as opposed right. to there being some set, yeah, set future. Um. And it's interesting too, the whole CERN reference, um, yeah. because, because, you know, when you get to the Chani project, do you remember the Chani project? I, that that was, familiar. okay. So, so it's really fascinating. The Chani project was this supposed project that occurred at a super collider, a secret super collider in Africa, where mm. the team at a certain point made contact with, um, another earth reality, another dimension. They were living on earth, but they had a whole different past and they have a whole different future, whole different history. And for, I think five years uh, or three years, something like that, up to the year 2000, they were in communication through text on a screen via the super collider. I don't know what they were doing, um, where they were communicating with this person being was a human on the other side. And so they were asking questions and this person was also asking them questions to get an understanding. The person claimed that they were a, um, a student and they were researching um, what we do here because they had access to this type of technology. Like for instance, they didn't have a moon because they had blown up their moon a long time ago when they found out that it was causing too much uh, society disarray, too much disarray within society. The moon was? The moon. You got to read this. I, it's the Chani Project. It's absolutely fascinating. So, so the story actually started out as being a, um, 
a, a person who works in an intelligence agency and it was the intelligence agency's job to release these types of stories to the public in order to gauge public's response to it. And Which, so, so basically this is like a psychological operation study. Yes. And we found that was absolutely true with the Chani project. We found that this indeed did happen with the Chani project. And a lot of these projects are to one degree or another aspects of truth and aspects of not truth, right? Almost like, like a movie, like we were talking Almost about. Almost like a movie. Exactly. And, and a lot of it is to gauge public response to it, to see how that, how people react to it. Um, now with, with the John Titer story, it is like that, except that John Titer wasn't the one doing it. The one on the internet wasn't the one doing it. It was, it was like there were aspects of technology um, that were true and real. And some of this has happened in pieces, but this was like collated into one central story that was meant for consumption and an operation to see how people react. Um, so I don't know. I mean, when you get to a lot of these stories that are like this, you have to, you, you have to take them with a big grain of salt, but you also have to understand that, that, that aspects of them are, are fed and created around this huge nut of a story that did happen, but it's to see what people are going to do with it, how they're going to react to it. Are they ready for ideas like this? Mm, which, which really, wow. What you just said is pretty mind blowing because if there is a, a large amount that could potentially be disclosed to the public, gauging where people are at to accept those things or not would be, really important right it's like how how much can you release at once in order for there to not be chaos potentially right 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 yeah and that's the thing with this story it's like it's like it's un unlike the chani project the chani project was was from what i can understand with our data was pretty true to the core um when you get a john titer it's it's not that this guy did this stuff or was doing this stuff. It is that this stuff does happen, is happening, yet it centrally it wasn't him who was doing it. It was like a, a, a pulling all these different stories and technologies together to put into that framework that he existed within in order to, to tell it. So, yeah. Yeah. It's weird. It's like it's it's like, you know, a lot of people say that movies are soft disclosure. Basically, they're feeding you the truth through a fictional story. Right. In order to release information without fully hard releasing something that's going on. Right. Yeah. And the Internet really made that easier. The yeah. Grassroots level. You can go into conspiracy forums and present these things to see how people react to them. In fact, the Chani Project was first. I think it was just first posted on like John Titer on Art Bell. The Chani project was first posted on Godlike Productions forum. So they use these. They use these to, to release stuff. Hmm. That's really, really interesting because it makes in some ways for me somehow, it makes the John Titer story even more compelling. Yeah, I agree. Like, why, you know, who was releasing the info it doesn't even matter whether the guy's name was john titer or not it's uh you know who was releasing this and why kind of and 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 how much of it was was true like all of it could have been true a portion of it could have been true but yeah and then this this paradox starts to form around the story because you've got this this hero character who's gone back in time to try to save the world from these possible issues that he's claiming are going to are going to happen in like 2004 2005 2004 and 5 come to pass and people are like oh the john titer story was uh was all fake and then it's like well but it didn't happen so right. 
did he save the planet or not? Right. Right. That's called that's called non falsifiable. So, yeah. So he was able to have a non falsifiable outcome to it. <laughs> but that's what it's called. Right. Yeah. So. So, yeah, if all of that did come true, then John Titor failed. And the story is absolutely true, but didn't come true. So he succeeded. And, you know, I mean, it's non falsifiable. Yeah, I love the story. It's so, I mean, like it kept me awake at nights when I was younger. Yeah, because it's so amazing to listen to and then read the messages around it. Yeah. But you yeah. have these, you have these like, like there are um, agencies that specifically do this kind of stuff. Oh, and, there and, are and, as, and, aspects of agencies that do this, that, that literally um, receive, they don't like a person in one of these um, positions doesn't actually know truly what happened they just go through this this is what we've seen with remote viewing they just go through this this process of taking orders on what story aspects to follow when they put it out um and then someone else is gauging reaction to see how that how that goes you know so these these, these are these are things that they do do in psychological operations intelligence especially when it comes to these crazy stories testing us because we got to remember they're they're at least a hundred years ahead on technology than we realize yeah yeah that's always in the back of my head you know this question of like what's really out there what's really going on and and it's like you and i discussed why is no one coming forward and talking about it you know yeah <laughs> i know what it's happened kind of area, ended with area 51 you know really did yeah. It's so it's so controlled now. So yeah, unless um, all of those were operations, which I tend towards, you know. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, we, we were bringing up this John Titer story. We mentioned Project Looking Glass. I just want to remind everyone that we just recently did an episode on Project Looking Glass. Um, and you can watch our episode on it. It's called Project Looking Glass Technology and Remote Viewing. And the Mandela effect. So we we actually entered the time distortion, you know, uh, conversation through through this uh, Project Looking Glass and the Mandela effect even before that. So definitely go check those out. Um, so you know, talking about the the John Titer story, I think is a good way to enter all of this because he was the way he described technology the technology was described so well, even understanding what CERN is doing, how they would use CERN and how a singularity may cause all of the time uh, travel technology, which even to this day, we're in 2023, people are still discussing as being the way that time travel would potentially exist because it's all about wormholes. You know, you're creating a, a mass you're creating a wormhole, you're going through the wormhole, another wormhole is created to exit and you're bending space to get from one point to another. Space, time, gravity, all of these things affect one another and are potentially even one thing or intertwined. So time travel really is the result of this recipe of different things that we described earlier in this conversation when we were talking about time dilation. And, right. Um, you got you the know. portable device as well. I mean, it's like he's not like, He's not stuck to a CERN like super collider. He's literally got this portable device. And there are pictures of it. Right. There are yeah. pictures of it. So, like, how many other instances of time travel do you have people showing a portable device or talking about them having a portable device and it being absolutely believable on the science side? I think that's, I think that is actually one of the most fascinating parts of the story to me because I haven't come across really anything that has a portable device in it, except for back to the future, you know? Yeah, the flux capacitor. <laughs> right. You know, what's crazy too, though, is like, let's, let's say this is all true. CERN is the biggest machine in the world. You can't strap CERN onto your backpack. So if CERN is capable of, of you know, distorting time or affecting time, we're talking about like a 16, 17 mile tunnel you know, where they're, they're actually doing these experiments, right? So it being portable, 
would be i mean think about like the first computers were right. the size of rooms right and now they're down to like your phone is more powerful than that computer right so it, it's possible that the technology from cern gets put down into this portable device somehow some way you know using the the um you know yeah I mean, right you can think about like mainframes in the 1970s down to yes. you know smartphones today for sure yeah so yeah, that's what I liked most about the story, like the 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 technology aspect and how it was so precise in in how he was relating it was to me was was fantastic because this is the stuff that actually starts to feel more real about it in general, I think. Yeah. Um and then and then and then you sit here and you go, okay, so movies quite often are soft disclosure. Um, we talk about this a lot. So you got to wonder what came first, the chicken or the egg here when it comes to the movie Back to the Future. Because here you have what appears to be an operation to reveal information about something. Could it be that that stuff happened a longer time ago? Back to the Future is the soft disclosure of it. Exactly. Exactly. And it's like, well, are these things just good ideas or is there some truth to this? Right. To these stories? Because... It's hard, like bending your mind, you know, to, to come up with a story like that. Of course, humans are really creative, but it's still really interesting. Like people want, who doesn't want this story to be true? You know, right. it's a cool story. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, during the end of John Titer's story, before he disappeared for good, he did talk about having to put his device in a car and getting up to speed in order for it to work. <laughs> He did. That's true. Yeah. It was, he had to like put it in a truck or something because it, it right. had to be able to hold the the weight of the carbon or something. Right. right. Yeah, that's right. That's really funny. So, you know, actually, if you're really interested in the technology part of this, we are going to be getting into very soon some actual patents that have been created out there for similar devices. So hold on to your hats there. Um but we're going to ease into that by talking about a couple of stories here. So this one is a New York Times article for a split second, a quantum computer made history go backward. So using an IBM quantum computer, scientists managed to undo the aging of a single simulated elementary particle by one millionth of a second. Scientists currently believe that under general conditions, a single particle probably can't go backward without help and careful tinkering. So um, Valeri M. Vin Vinicor of Argonne National Laboratory said, we demonstrate that time reversing even one quantum particle is an unsurmountable task for nature alone. The system comprising two particles is even more irreversible, let alone the eggs comprising billions of particles. We break to prepare an omelet. Okay. So, yeah, not like this is a classic softball New York Times article where they're right. like celebrating over, you know, uh, the change over one one millionth of a second in simulated time. It's not even real time. So so they simulated that it happened, uh, but they think it's too hard to really work without or with with more particles, basically. All right. So then. We have Russian cosmonaut Sergei Krikalev. Sergei Krikalev. 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 Yeah, he's the worst. He's the, sorry, the worst. He's the world's <laughs> first time traveler record holder. So, uh, so this Russian cosmonaut spent more. I don't time believe that for a second. Right. I don't believe that. A record holder for, no, uh -uh. not, not yeah. for a second. So he, he says he's spent more time in orbit around the Earth than anyone, 803 days, 9 hours and 39 minutes. Due to the effects of time dilation, Krikalev has actually lived for 0 0.02 seconds less than everyone else on Earth. Effectively, he's traveled 0 0.02 seconds into his own future. And now this relies on Einstein's concept of relativity, implying that the passage of time is relative and different for two objects moving at different speeds or experiencing different levels of gravity. And this is where we were talking about earlier, where if 
you know, you're talking about planets and the immense speed that planets are moving at different places in their own solar system, never mind in uh, in a solar, si I'm sorry, in a galaxy or something like that. We've got all kinds of different things that could take place potentially, different galaxies and different times, etc. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder if this guy, I wonder if this guy had like deja vus constantly. Whoa, whoa, that just happened. <laughs> that just happened. I mean... <laughs> What, what, what's the, what's the physical effect of this? You know? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Is it, is it like a, just a normal thing kind of like it was in interstellar where he doesn't, he, he still feels like he's a certain age and his daughter is way older than him or, right. or not, you know, like, because I imagine like being out in space and, and being in that environment affects your psychology anyway, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> But I don't think, you know, I don't think he, he's the first world public record holder, because I think that there's I mean, let's get let's get to the children who are involved in the Montauk project. I mean, exactly. Come on. You know, but hey, we can't talk about that because it didn't happen. Well, right? and also it's probably been MK Ultra out of their mind, if that's true. Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, this is yeah. this was one of the first things that Preston Nichols was describing within his book, the Montauk project was that he was living in Montauk and all of a sudden people started to say strange things to him. They were like referring to him in a certain way and he was confused. And then his memory started to slowly come back about a few things. And then all of a sudden it started to pop open and, right. and, and, you know, I think that probably the first rule of any, I mean, what if now they, they had to do go through all of this effort? Like we know about MK Ultra now, right? We know about MK Ultra. We know that they had systems to try to do these things. What if their technology or their method has gotten so good that now they only need something like the men in black, you know, light um, uh, blinker or whatever it is to erase someone's memory? We don't know. Um, could be quite advanced now. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that we see with, with these time traveler, dimensional travelers is that their minds become extremely fractured. Maybe. Okay. So, you know, going back to the previous ep episode and talking about what if there was a physical construct that can adapt itself to time travel easily. And, but what if that construct isn't necessarily physical, but what if it's mental? And what if, what if, there's a positive aspect of the MK Ultra program in that it can create, even though when we view it, these people appear very fractured mentally because of what they've gone through. Um, I mean, how can you not be if you're jumping around in time and going to the, you know, the in between space? Um, what if it's a mental construct that has to be adapted? What if MK Ultra is part of creating a more adaptive mental construct? Because children and the reason why they used children was because their minds were more malleable to the process man right? yeah that's mind-blowing yeah yeah like that's that's crazy like what yeah mk i never even considered that mk ultra could be used for anything other than just right a more practical use of just erasing someone's memory or, or control but right what if it was more than that that's right plausible right. too yeah. I mean, I, I think it, I think it probably is. I, there's, I think that there's got to be um, a mental adaptation that has to be worked on before a person is to do this. Otherwise they may just go utterly insane. Yes, totally. Okay. So um, real patents for theoretical concepts of time travel. We've got some examples here, you guys, and it's really interesting. Now, of course, keep in mind, I think anyone could create a patent for something, right? Like having a patent doesn't necessarily mean you've pulled off the technology. But the fact that these are out there and describe what I would call somewhat reasonable ways of creating time dilation, time distortion, or time travel is very interesting. We've got a method of gravity distortion and time display displacement patent hmm. okay you can see it here oh, that's interesting okay now the 
this is method of gravity distortion and time travel time displacement displacement patent the present invention relates to the use of technical time displacement devices which operate by the modification of gravitational fields these drive systems do not depend on the emission of matter to create thrust to take advantage of time dilation, but rather create a change in the curvature of space time in accordance with general relativity. This allows travel across top topologies by warping space time to produce a topology change from one space like boundary to the other in accordance with Garak's theorem. Now, this is Garak 1967. Have you ever heard of this guy, Garak? No, I haven't. I mean, it's like, you know, when you get to patents, it's really interesting because if this, if, if there's got to be an aspect of this that um, they allowed to be out there in the public, um, because you know what happens with patents? If, if you really do come across something, it, it's gone. It gets, it gets pulled off. Um, military takes it. Um, you know, it's like the guy who created, uh, I think he created a patent for, um, a car that ran off water. You remember that? It was like 1990s, yes. 1980s or something. I mean, a car that ran off hydrogen, ran off tap water. And, um, he had started to say the military wants it. The military's, you know, trying to get it for me. And then the guy dies. He has a heart attack not long after, and it completely disappears. No one ever talks about this thing again. Um, and so any sort of novel patent is not necessarily, it's going to probably give you little ideas. Maybe patents are also used as a soft disclosure, right? Because if there's anything that's going to be absolutely groundbreaking, public's not going to get it. Not like that. No way. Oh, you're muted. No way. And the people that the people that invented them too are not like that's not a simple issue. Right. They're either going to be taken in and used by the military to create war crazy stuff. Right. You know, or they're just going to be asked to stop, most likely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Stanley Meyer. Yeah. Now, yeah, this is his water powered car here that he created. And uh, and there was a 14 year old who created some type of hydroelectric engine recently as well, isn't there, Lindsay? Remember we were talking about this on the sh on uh, on the show like a few a few weeks ago or something or a few months ago. Yeah, I'm looking for him. I think it was a nuclear reactor. Fusion was it? Reactor? I thought it was. I thought it was hydro. Hi I thought it was hydroelectric. Maybe it was nuclear. I'm looking. Yeah. So, and this is the guy that claimed to die because he knew how to turn water into fuel. That's yeah, right. and you know there was a. I think TV news shows went and interviewed him. He was demonstrating it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I don't know, but it seems to me that these patents. Um, would at the very least be a soft disclosure as opposed to something truly, I don't know, like out in the field that humans, human public can create. I mean, this is probably, this is why the military is in black projects are a hundred years ahead as far as tech goes. Yeah. Yeah. It's also why we don't see anything crazy. Cause yeah. like as soon as, as soon as there's like an 11 year old kid or a 14 year old kid that figures something out, I think they're going to get a visit. Well, that's the thing too. It's like, think it's like, like rocket technology, gasoline, jet fuel, rocket fuel, cars running off gasoline. Like how long have we been doing that? How long yeah. have we been using the same type of engine to do these things? Technology is not advanced. I mean, look <laughs> at computers, look at how computers advance from mainframes to your phone. I mean, that is some serious advancement. Whereas we still use, you know, same exact words, right? Yeah. It's like, come on. No, 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 no. This is suppressed technology, technology, like the oil industry makes a lot of money on cars in general, right? Vehicles. I mean, come on. That's that, that is being pushed in our face and everything else is being suppressed free energy. In fact, you know, we need to do a show on that. 
I think that's that would open up a lot of eyes to what what actually is out there um, that we like if we truly did have a CO2 problem, then why don't we just shift and pull these things out of black projects? Yeah, I mean, we, we would be able to create technology that could that could definitely deal with these issues. Right. Why not do right. it? If our cars are causing so many problems, then let's just pull out the free energy. Right. Right. Let's use let's use the, the cars that run off tap water. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. And then and then meanwhile, it's our fault for buying a car when there's no right. other options. Right. No, That's let's a... shift to batteries. Right. OK. <laughs> right. That's a whole other problem in and of itself. Yeah, totally. Totally. The lithium. Crazy. Um, yeah. Th oh, so. Lindsay, you found this, the kid, right? So it was a nuclear fusion reactor. So the kid's name is Jackson Oswald. Wait, so let me get this straight. A kid actually created a new nuclear fusion reactor. 12-year-old, John. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. My name is I Jackson mean, Oswald, and my Guinness World Records title is the youngest person to build a nuclear fusion reactor. So as a kid, I've always been interested in building things. And when I was younger, I always worked in my grandfather's wood shop building little figurines and things like that. And all of that creativity eventually led up to building something like this. That's crazy. Um, well, you know, John, like what you were just saying, we've got a 14 or 12 year old boy here who created this. Okay. So just to put this into perspective, Everyone nowadays in 2023, I think it's safe to say, thinks that everyone, even 50 years ago, 70 years ago, 100 years ago, was somehow less intelligent. Like a news article will get pulled up where they're talking about what they found in the Egyptian desert or in Ohio or whatever. And they're like, oh, well, they were just they, these old people didn't know what they were talking about. They really saw this. I know because I was there. No, you weren't there. You have no idea what they saw or what they were talking about. But what's so funny is if you look at the technology that was developed between 1890 and 1930, all the inventions that came out, humans were rolling, man. Like mm -hmm. Tesla, Einstein, like all of these like cars. We had Ford coming out with like the vehicle, you know, all of these guys coming out, the light bulb, humans flew for the first time. I mean, we're talking about like all of this crazy stuff, right? Actually, I, I don't remember the exact dates with flying, but you get what I'm trying to say. The yeah. point is, the only development we've had over the last like 40 years has been in computers and nowhere else. Yeah. Like, like, did humans really slow down? Like, we're not smart enough to, to like, actually improve rockets that we're going to the moon on or improve cars to the extent where, like, the most innovation that's happened with vehicles has been definitely Tesla over the last, like, 10 or 15 years. And it's because he's having engineers look at how the engines could work to make a better vehicle within the car. If it wasn't right. for Elon, vehicles would have gone nowhere. Why? Right. Is it that we're Why? not capable enough to create something better? Where's my hoverboard? Right. I know. Well, you know, I mean, as an aside, it's like, have you ever picked up a, a, a textbook from, let's say, high school, any kind of textbook from high school from like the 1950s, 1940s, maybe? You're not going to most people are not going to understand what's 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 going on with that. More advanced. Because because. It's not that we we have lost intelligence or don't have the capacity for higher intelligence. It's that it's 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 not being utilized. It's just not being utilized now. And everybody seems to think these days that somebody else is going to do it for them. You know, I mean, that's why, you know, this kid's interesting to me because here here he is, uh, you know, I mean, reinventing the wheel. But he's 12 years old doing something that is pretty darn astounding for a 12 year old. And that's how we should be. Yeah. That's what we should be doing. So, but yeah, this is, yeah I think you, I think you guys talked about all that stuff um, in your edge of wonder, big oil episode. 
which was a fantastic episode. Yeah. 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 We, we hit on a bunch of this stuff and we got into the history uh, on rise.tv. This is the big, big oil industrial complex, basically what went down and how, how PR was used to create an industry. Essentially PR was created to create the oil industry, believe it or not. We've, we've gone through and shown everybody how that was done. It's actually pretty fascinating. So, um, yeah, uh, we'll get into, we'll just cover this really quick, but there is an AI time machine patent. And if there's going to be time machine, you'd think that these, the AI that's out there, there's already claims with AI that it can, time doesn't exist the same for like chat GPT, for instance, as it does for us, because you're talking about the speed of light being, you know, what, how it's transferring information, Right. Um, you 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 get a you get these AI like the AI is already being claimed to try to break out and get into the internet. If the if, where is the AI going to go if it wants to establish itself? Well, it's probably going to find itself a quantum computer. It's going to take the quantum computer over. The quantum computer is going to be able to do any type of mathematical breakdown of anything that it wants to figure out time travel to figure out anything. So like the idea that obviously time travel may not be that simple, but if we're talking about if having access to the entire computing um, infrastructure that we've created, the internet of things infrastructure. <laughs> yeah. It could, it could start trying to, it could start figuring out how to build things in the 3d world for sure. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, everything is everything these days is the Internet of Things IoT is huge as far as um, how everything is is wanting to be a connected device to the Internet. Now, your refrigerator, right. your toothbrush, where you're just in a cloud of frequency. And I mean, think about AI accessing all this stuff. It's like AI can calculate how to best have everyone commit suicide through every single device in their house and then lead you through that path. Right. Right. It wanted to take over the world. I don't think it would need to like take over. And well, yeah, I guess it could take over 3d printers as well. Exactly. Replicate Lindsay, itself pull, that, physically. pull that back up for a second. So she had highlighted something here. That's really interesting. So the AI time machines data structures comprising at least one dynamic robot to train the AI time machine, a main program with two modes, training mode and standard mode, external technologies comprising universal artificial intelligence programs, human level robots, psychic robots, super intelligent robots, the AI time machine, dynamic robots, a signalless technology, atom manipulators, ghost machines, a universal CPU, an autonomous prediction internet, and a 4D computer. Jeez. 4D computer. Like, this is wild. This patent is the most wild patent I've ever seen. That's why we had to cover this. Yeah, that's crazy. That's insane. I mean, this is scary stuff. That is scary. It's bad yeah. enough. Like, talk, like you bring AI into any of this stuff, and it immediately gets more scary. Right. I know. I mean, like, everything these days requires an app now. It's like everything is connected to the Internet. Everything's got a microchip in it and can be used or for whatever purpose for AI. I mean, yeah, it's a little scary to me. You know, okay. those prediction models are based off of our, our, our probabilistic paths, right? I mean, and well, advertising they use it for, right? So that's what they say. But the, the, those prediction, the prediction is for our probabilistic paths on what we're going to do next, which it's calculating. The more yes. internet of things you have around you and all your devices, the more, the easier it can figure out what you're going to do next. It's the Rehoboam of, you know, basically, if you guys have seen Westworld. Yeah. There is this AI machine called Rehoboam, which basically is predicting and planning everybody's future because it has so much data, you know, and basically, like, it's really interesting because in the past, like, 15 years every, or 10 years, I would say, everyone's just been talking about big data, crunching big data. I told you about this, John, before, where... You can't even find information on the secret Google um, warehouse that's in the middle of nowhere, which is basically like the new Area 51 of data crunching. 
Right. Like I went to look for it again, like 10 years ago, you could find information on it. Now you can't even find information about it anywhere on the internet, where it is or anything or what it's doing. Just it's been completely wiped. So if you've got AI now, now you've got all of this data being crunched and then you get AI that can plug into that data. And now you've got a prediction model and you've got psychic robots, basically. Well, to some extent, obviously the future isn't made yet. So it gives you probability or percentages of what's going to happen, you know? And then it can plan based off of those percentages, which is really interesting. And I think what's, you know, that kind of sets us up for this talk on cr the chronovisor because the chronovisor basically, actually, could you describe every to, to everyone what the chronovisor is, John? Yeah, I think it was, um, uh, there was a father, uh, I think it was a Jesuit priest. He worked at the Vatican and he was an ex-physicist. And this was in the 1950s. So he and a team of scientists apparently uh, created a device for the Vatican that could see into the past and the future. And uh, they called it the Chronovisor. It, it sort of created this holographic imagery <clears throat> of like Star of, Wars stuff, like Star Wars stuff. Right. Yeah. And um, he I guess his theory was that all events in the past exist and in the future exist as a frequency. And if you can tap into those frequencies, then you can decode them into imagery. <clears throat> so ultimately, that's what it is. And interestingly enough, you know, there was a guy that that had crossed our paths in the past um, who was uh, in, in the intelligence world and said that this thing was real, um, that yes, they do. He said they, which I don't know what they he was talking about, have a device that's like a quantum computer, which I assume he's talking about the chronovisor here because he brought up specifically that, that he had seen and they had taken pictures of Christ on the cross, which right. is literally like, if you go through the, the, the lore on the chronovisor, that's one of the images they say it took. So, you know, and then, and then he also said they would use remote viewers to kind of back up what they've been seeing on the chronovisor and to like expand out on situations. That's really interesting. Yeah. I heard, I heard another, not version of this, but I'm not sure exactly how they intersect, but Bill Wood in his interview, um, he, who, who was the interview with again? I always forget the name of the, the, the Cam interview. Um, Camelot. Yeah. Project Camelot. Thank you. Project Camelot interviewed Bill Wood and Bill Wood was releasing information on Project Looking Glass. And Bill Wood said that this technology that they had found, um, I guess, on originally on alien spacecraft led to the development of basically being able to predict the future. And it led to the development of more technology, if not the technology for the chronovisor, where they could actually look into the future or the past rather and, and see things both. I think, I think you could do either. And so um, this is Bill Wood here talking about that. It's a very interesting interview, actually uh, kudos to project looking glass for finding so many whistleblowers willing to come out. Um, and you know, that conversation keeps coming up as why aren't there any more now? Yeah. Now we've got people, you know, We've got whistleblowers coming out of like Facebook or Google to, to, you know, that's the most interesting thing we've got now. Not that that's not interesting. It's just like, yeah, it's kind of the area 51 people or whatever. The only thing we've got yeah. is Bill, you know, Bill Lazar, yeah. Bob Lazar, excuse Bob me. Lazar. Yeah. Right. Right. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, yeah, the chronovisor is a very, very, very interesting. I mean, I've often wished that I just had a pair of goggles that I could put on just to see what it, what certain time periods were like. Cause a lot of people will like ask you, you know, we'll do a Q and a session and people will like, if you could go back in time, where would you go? And I'd be like, that's a terrifying idea. Like actually going back in time and getting stuck is a terrible, terrifying idea. Right. So it's I know, like, it's like I don't want to be hanging out with Chaka for the rest of my life and land in the <laughs> right. lost. Forget about it. Like having slea stacks chase me. Yeah. yeah I'm, oh, Oh. I'd rather go watch, you know, this on TV. So the right. chronovisor is always like, I'd rather, you know, have a device like the chronovisor or a pair of VR goggles I could put on and watch all of this stuff, you know? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> That's why like remote viewing is good for agoraphobes because, you know, you just sit inside all day and, and let your mind travel, your community, your universe. You don't have to go right. out. <laughs> 
Yes, true. All right, so uh, one more thing to, to cover is Dick Glock. So Hitler had a uh, allegedly had a secret anti-gravity device that looked like a giant bell, and some believe it was capable of time travel and was based on UFO technology. Now, what's interesting about this is we were talking about this. There's a certain recipe of things that that affect time, and and gravity is one of them. So if you're if you're talking about anti-gravity, immediately it's creating a field some type of field. And if you have control over this field and you're able to manipulate the variables, you could potentially time travel. No, yeah, it's going to create time dilation. Yeah, for sure. Right. You know, and, and this this was a this is kind of a widely known thing, the Dick Lock. I mean, do you, John, have you ever looked into Dick Lock at all? Oh, it's, yes. I mean, like tangentially, like not, not necessarily straightforward because, um, you know, we had seen with the whole Admiral Byrd Antarctica thing, um, uh, there were some aspects of Nazis and UFOs, <laughs> right, uh, involved in that whole mix when we remote viewed, but we never actually like remote viewed the Diglock program, which is something we have to do. But in our data, we do know that that the whole anti gravity thing with a craft was being worked on by the Nazis and they had it somewhat solved. And a lot of aspects around World War II and Operation Paperclip wasn't about rockets. Wasn't about rockets. So, yeah. So, so Operation Paperclip. So what's really interesting about that is we're talking about the 1940s, right? Yeah. So in the 1940s, Operation Paperclip occurs. They've already worked out the gravity problem, according to what you just said. Now, you're talking about the not 1950s. like all of it, not like all of it. No, right. not all of it. Like there were some huge advances, but, but still, yeah, the 1950s and the 1960s now look ridiculous because at the end mm -hmm. of the 1960s was the first time we used a crap ton of rocket fuel to go to the moon. Well, it's all theater. It's all right. theater. All of it. Right. There's so nothing now. Yeah, we're looking at we don't even know at, in the 1940s and the uh, sorry, the 50s and the 60s. We don't even know behind the scenes what they're producing. And all we're seeing is a potential rocket that could go to space with a few astronauts. But behind the scenes, if he had already worked out the gravity problem in the 40s and the Operation Paperclip occurred. Now, you know, what we're seeing with the Manhattan Project, with the Philadelphia experiment leading all the way up to Montauk is this other path of technology that's moving, you know, in that direction that we're very unaware of. And it only gets released, you know, years after anything's happened. Right. You know? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I know. So it comes down to this, everybody. There's a lot of stories of time travel. Lots of stories of time travel, people claiming to be time travelers, people claiming to meet themselves in the future. Not all of them are potentially real. Some of them could be uh, what John was talking about, where there are operations going on to kind of monitor how people's reactions to these things. The question is, is it true? Could it be true? And the answer is definitely yes. It's a resounding yes, as they would say on Ancient Aliens. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I know. It's, it's, it's all that we've ever seen. I mean, this is, this is not the stuff of science fiction. Or it is the stuff of science fiction in reality. Ultimately. Yeah, we're, we're, not, we're not ancient astronaut theorists like they are in Ancient Aliens. But this stuff is definitely true. <laughs> yeah. Because how could it not be with all of the technology and everything? It's uh, it'd be crazy if it wasn't at this point. We just don't know. And I mean, then then it just goes back straight back in a circle, right back to the Mandela effect, where you've got all of these bizarre time anomalies that are occurring with right. things that we actually experienced growing up that are no longer there. Right. I know. So, is it not our technology that's causing those things? What else could it be? You know, I don't think divine, like, you know, we're talking about billions of years or, or whatever of the, the universe existing and we've got everything seemed to be normal. And then all of a sudden it's like Sinbad never acted. Right. In, you know, like 
<laughs> he never acted in uh what was it called Shazam or whatever right. you know Ed McMahon never held up checks um Tom Hanks is saying different things and Forrest Gump it's magic mirror on the wall and and yeah. Darth Vader never said Luke I am your father I mean it's pretty crazy um yeah, but you guys, thank you for being with us today. I think we went a little over right now too. We're gonna we're gonna have to end the show right now, but we hope you enjoyed all of this interesting conversation around John Titer, around um, space technology or time travel technology, and all of the discussion on what's uh, what's been going on. And John, thanks for being here. Thank you. Good times. All right. Well, oh, sorry. What did you say? Good times. Yeah. Good times. Yes. Yeah. Well, you guys, um, hope you thought that this uh, episode was as out of this world as we did, and we'll see you all next time.